Yeah, I feel a little out of place here. I do go to the library quite often, but I don't work there, so I do forgive me for that. Uh, I am an engineer. I think I'm just here because I was on a couple of conference calls a few months ago, uh, and uh, this is what I'll be presenting to you prepared by Dr. David Bateman at uh, EP Austin CRWR there. And he said I could use it, so I am. All I did was cut some stuff out of it. So uh, uh, if anything's wrong or anybody's name is left off, remember the name David Bateman. Uh, in Texas, just like everywhere else, I guess there's, there's a lot of similarity uh, between the, the issues that were just stated and some of the things I can mention as well, so it's good to hear and want to hear about the answers for them. Uh, Texas is a big state, uh, not the biggest state, we know that, uh, but we have our, uh, quite a plethora and spectrum of water problems in any given year. We might have flooding and drought at the same time. Now, the Longhorns there because that's the day that works, okay? Uh, and I guess there was brown grass around it, but uh, maybe you can see its ribs that kind of make you uh, We have a great variation in water quality uh, from place to place within our state, whether it's from surface water or groundwater. And then uh, concerns about, uh, uh, we finally learned how to spell ecology in Texas over the last 20 years. So <laughs> not to worry about that. Uh, the discussion here is that uh, we just heard about 10 years for additional uh, water-related library. Uh, we've been going on this more than 10 weeks, but less than 10 months, right? <laughs> so so uh, this is, uh, uh, we're still on our diapers here with this, so uh, that's why we're here and some other representatives of Texas A&M and UT Austin uh, to learn uh, from other folks and how do we accomplish stuff with limited resources. I'm glad that was pointed out because the requirement to do more with less uh, at least not the universities, uh, but that's what we have. Okay, so first off, we'll talk about the Texas Water Digital uh, Library. Little bit. Uh, the main thing that's happened this past year is getting people together across uh, university lines, which among these universities isn't always easy. Uh, we have people from uh, the Texas Digital Library without the W uh, that are kind of leading the effort. Uh, TANU stands for Texas A&M University, uh, and they have the Water Resources Research Institute there, uh, led by Bill Harris and some other folks. The libraries, uh, some folks were, were shown there out of the Texas Tech Water Resources Center. And uh, we have uh, Matthew McKinney was from uh, listed on this, but we have uh, we have Innocent here today, representing Texas Tech and other interests. And then uh, from the UT Center for Research and Water Resources, there's a David May and uh, the is here from the uh, UT Libraries. Uh, so that this isn't even the list of everybody that's uh, in state can get us started. Now also, uh, you know, Texas is a big state, and so we have a lot of universities. Uh, one of the things we like to point out in light of limited resources is that the University of Texas at Austin and Texas A&M and College Station get 70% of the, of the public university funds, while the rest of us uh, fight under the table uh, to see what we can get. But we have about uh, 12 uh, or so uh, universities that all say they have a water uh, research center of some sort, and that's great because we have local interests that need to be served for municipal, agricultural, and uh, range and wildlife, ranching management issues that serve all sorts of natural sciences and engineering purposes. So uh, it's, it's okay to have that in all these places. Okay, one of the things you guys, uh, you guys know all about this, uh, back in the 90s when we finally started putting uh, theses and dissertations on, on the web, now that really scared us faculty members. Does that scare you as librarians? You know, what scares me because it's like plagiarized. You know, here it is. <laughs> Here, download this, copy the large sections of this stuff. But it's okay, we're our saving trees, and I, I, my bookshelves will last longer than my office now. Uh, but uh, that started back in the 90s at the CRWR in Austin, uh, and then became part of their uh, repository and their libraries later. Uh, and so that became available uh, at uh, Texas A&M College Station. Their Water Resources Institute began that uh, also several years ago. And then at Texas Tech, it went the other way. The libraries were the ones who uh, started to put in the theses and dissertations, and they are in the process of trying to digitize uh, reports that have been sitting on the shelves or, or in our doors uh, from, from the past. So uh, in terms of the water research centers, uh, I, like, I like this phrase here. We're individually embracing the digital libraries. We have a library and this whole so And uh, so this is just uh, his. Uh, this is like our signatures here to say the director of the centers want to work with it. Uh, we all have generated over our lifetimes uh, technical reports. Uh, in the old days, one of the things you had to do is in water resources 
center of some sort. We had to have this agreement that any time you put out a numbered report, it had to go to a certain minimum number of libraries and you may have lived in that time. Uh, but that doesn't happen anymore. Nobody can afford that anymore. Nobody has the money to do that. So uh, that is, for the smaller budget organizations like mine, that fell off the table a while ago. Still, we do research. We have to put out uh, project data and reports to our uh, clients, to the customers, so we'll pay for it for them. Uh, and of course, the students generate the thesis and dissertation, and things are much more electronic now. Big uh, BL had a nice quote here just to say that how important it was to work across these lines. And I guess that's one thing I hope, I'm just curious if the states share with. And usually, most states have a university of blank, and then they have a blank in and or a blank state university, you know, the, the, uh, the, the land grant university. For those of you from states where both of those exist, do they get along real well? <laughs> So that's why it's a big deal. That, that's why you put down this quote that uh, uh, David did from, from DL. Uh, who actually, DL Harris is a, is a Texas Tech graduate who works at AM. And I'm a UT graduate who works at Texas Tech. And, and David's from this deal. <laughs> anyway, uh, Digital Water Library will link and make available the vast amount of information, research, and data that has been and is continuing to be developed by water resource researchers in Texas. We keep working, uh, whether it's in engineering or agriculture or natural sciences. Providing information digitally is imperative for the future, and this library is definitely going to bring critical and needed information together for everyone's use. Okay, so that's the thing to get to the legislators coming from. And the uh, Texas Water Digital Library is pretty much this so far, right? We've got to start with a website and things will be going into it. And we're, uh, so that's, uh, you guys have seen websites before, and you'll see the URL is available down below, and it's slowly being populated uh, with information from different places. As we look at the mission, you know, you got to have a mission and all the vision and all the other stuff. The mission is to be a centralized online location for the research and works of university and other water resource entities in Texas, effectively federating water research currently housed at many universities across Texas. And just like you just heard in the previous presentation and others today, uh, we, the pendulum goes back and forth, doesn't it? Sometimes we want to centralize stuff, sometimes we don't. If you centralize something somewhere, does that mean they get all the money and the other people don't anymore? Uh, is that really what you want? Is there going to be an IT party, you know, to break things back up? I didn't think that joke would work. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but it is at least an effort while well, we're starting off that we would like to, to share information in a useful manner because we actually work in each other's backyard. Next, uh, we have something brand new, the Texas Water Journal. Y'all are probably aware of that. It may be a challenge to being a librarian nowadays is that anybody with a website can start an electronic journal. And uh, so why don't we? Actually, this actually didn't come from the universities. This was born from the state agencies that deal with water. Depending on which day you count, Texas, that number can be anywhere between 2 and 12, depending upon what they're fighting. So uh, one of the interests that the agencies came to the universities with through committees that they interact on was we wanted to put useful research findings in a place where the agency employees can look readily and find a lot of the stuff we put into our uh, you know theses and dissertations are just too long to read, right? And then the stuff we put in our academic journals uh, are written in jargon to get them published and they're not necessarily useful to the kind of people who have to serve the citizens directly. So the purpose of the Texas Water Journal, which uh, since this was put up, it has to add at least uh, one issue. I think the second one's about to come out. Uh, is to put that stuff in that kind of uh, format. And so that's another interaction across the state. The last thing is the Texas Water Data Library. This is what uh, David's really into being a, a data GIS kind of guy. Uh, you probably heard, you've probably heard David before. You know, he's very involved with ESRIs and ArcGIS and ArcHydro and a lot of the other products that go along with that process. And so, one of the things that these people envision, we're going to hear more from Ilya about uh, as well, is how do we get uh, real-time data or, or all the data that's out there available to people so they know where it comes from and where it's applied. And so there is a, a vision among these people to try to create a framework where information can be connected long distances and over short periods of time. One of the things that uh, we appreciate about this is that you know people say you know, about the weather, everybody talks about it and nobody does anything about it. Okay, people talk about water a lot and they don't like it, but when we try to quantify it for people, we all are stuck with the perceptions of where we live and what we're used to seeing. 
And so uh, we need kind of a map to help us. So part of what this is about is to use the geography and geographic information systems to show you where you are on the planet, like on the watershed picture we have over there. Recognize that at a given point in the stream channel, there could be a stream gauging station that was talked about this morning that's generating data uh, about the flows in real time. Uh, sometimes that's a big interest if the floods go. Sometimes it's slow interest when we have drought. But anyway, that information still shows variability over time, which sometimes we forget about. As Lily is going to talk about the collaboration of universities, excuse me, consortium of universities for advancement of hydrologic sciences incorporated. I practiced that for 20 minutes last night. <laughs> and, uh, and somebody hit a, a line right to the gap and I lost it to San Francisco again. Anyway, uh, Quasi has been working on this, uh, uh, all these challenges. And Ilya will be talking to you about that just to let you know this includes universities spread across uh, most of uh, the United States. And part of what this is about is to trans uh, transform, I guess that's a big word within this step and other folks right now, transforming the information access. So the little photo we have on the left represents a point in space where perhaps a, a water level measurement is being turned into a flow measurement. That flow measurement over time turns into a hydrograph and a graph, and then that should be shown as an integrated map view. At that point on that river is downstream of some other points upstream, it's upstream of other points downstream, and what does that mean? So that's what they're trying to do to make those data uh, connect to each other and make them available. Okay, so now we've got these three components uh, in this vision. Uh, I think everybody appreciates the library sharing, the journal is okay, uh, data is especially all about the data, so how do we connect these components to each other? For example, uh, and I guess one of the questions was just brought up a few minutes ago in the previous presentation, what do we say? What do we say? Now, is it amazing to even on cable TV we have a show every week about borders? H-O-A-R-D-E-R-S. Is that amazing to you? That somebody will film that and put that on TV? And, uh, and uh, uh, well, is that what librarians and archivists are? <laughs> You know, engineers are just as bad, okay? Uh, but we're not talking about collecting cats here, right? We're talking about collecting information. So what should we keep? What has different value? And as a professor, uh, I know what things get me and my faculty promoted. Okay, and those are, those are archival where we journal articles. That's what happens. As a funded researcher, I know that I have to generate reports to the client. Uh, as a teacher and overseer of graduate students, I know they have to generate something that maybe you know, the thesis and dissertation may be going away compared to what now we just kind of write the articles. But along the way, not every thought of beat of the heart may not get, get reported and that may bother some people. We might in this process connect an article that might be for example in the in the Texas Water Journal to an academic study that might have been done as part of a research project funded by a uh, uh, an external source, or it could be something that's funded by the local water resources research center. They can, can then, if you generate data, and if you know data payment, or if you're in quasi, you can connect that information on the planet to uh, the uh, all the funny acronyms they have in the quasi world, so that other people can share that. Now, do other people want to see the input data files you use to run HHMS? Well, maybe, maybe not. But we can make it available. We have the ability. Is that the right thing to do? Also, that can connect to professional studies. In this situation, you can't quite read it. This is about the city of Sanderson, Texas, in Terrell County, a very small town that had a devastating flood in the mid-1960s. Um, it pretty much blew the whole town away uh, because it wouldn't much town to blow. And it was built along this creek that never had water in it except this one time. And, uh, the, uh, and so Dr. Maitland's students worked with a consulting firm called AECOM to generate a new flood study for insurance purposes for the people in that community. The community itself could not afford it to have that study uh, done. I mean, the whole Carroll County is the biggest county in the whole state that has the fewest people uh, per, per unit area. That can also be linked to reports and presentations. PowerPoints change the world, right? You know, is, is a PowerPoint an article? I don't know. It's something that's written down. Is it, is it an article if it's a PDF and nobody can change it? You know, what, what does that mean? How do we connect those uh, as well? 
and then again the, the models and data in terms of the engineer's product, the scientist's product, we can provide information to the people that they can use, but how long is that model going to stay static? How long is that input format going to be appropriate? Uh, you know, how long will that model even be improved you know, uh, by, by other folks? You've got to struggle with that, uh, that persistence issue yourself. It's almost done. The additional and data library goals and challenges moving forward, actually uh, uh, the previous speaker did a much better job of listing these, so I'm almost embarrassed because I'm sure I listed But uh, essentially for us, again, we're just uh, trying to get up on our knees there in Texas. The digital library process, following the examples like you guys have said here, is much more formal and further along because we have a lot of to learn from people like you, and there has been some collaboration, as was mentioned. The data process, there's still arguments about which data really needs to be shared and what's of interest to people. Who really cares about what? So there's issues about workflow for submitting and registering data and documents, as was just mentioned to, and the versioning of the information, temporary living versus permanent archive. That's a, a big challenge, a lot of decisions to be made for that. External users and providers. You know, for us uh, in engineering, a lot of our data we hope people will really use to make a lot better on the planet. And so how do we make it accessible to the consultants or alums out there that might need it? And is there an intellectual property concern about who developed what, what who should be paid for the information? Uh, that's a challenge. And then what is the role of informal student products projects compared to formal documents? I mean, if we generate a, a paper for an archive journal, that means everybody worked on it, it's been reviewed, we made it an A plus or we'll get in, right? That's what we assume. That's what we assume. When you're a reviewer, you may not always say that. But a student formal student project, what if they made a C? Is that something we want on the website? They got most of it right. You know, so there's a struggle about that, what we put where. Personally, as a guy who teaches a class that might be taught again, I don't want the old student projects up there because uh, I might get to see them again. And finally, some questions uh, as and these, uh, again, these hit some of the philosophical points that were brought up in the previous talk. Now, how do we, for, for David, how do we understand the, the difference between a digital library and a data library? You know, are they the same thing? I would argue they're not. So it's kind of key to argue. You know, are you, a, are you a, a quantitative calculation person who wants to repeat similar calculations? The people that care about that might be the only ones that care about how that information is preserved and, and uh, made accessible. The description of the procedures and the findings is of interest to a broader group of people, we hope. Yeah, but those interests may be different. Now, how do we connect digital libraries to different organizations? Do we need to keep centralizing? Amelia will we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, is it all just links? Links may be enough, or do we want to have more sharing? And then finally, what's the uh, meaning of a repository of data services as, as, as opposed to data files? Some people would like to make available the ability to repeat calculations or use the same tools through their website rather than just here's the numbers we use. So uh, there's some uh, discussions about that in terms of how the different university involved people want to serve their perceived audience. I appreciate a lot hearing about the other surveys, really finding out what your audience wants, and I appreciate your honesty in dealing with those struggles. And that's it. Thank you.